This video is a defense of the Holy Salutary Doctrine of Universal Objective Justification, or UOJ. This video is primarily directed at those who call themselves Lutheran but deny this doctrine, so this is not a direct critique of Reformed theology. Several of our arguments are going to assume doctrine that all who bear the name Lutheran believe, like universal atonement. So if you want to critique this video by saying that universal atonement is false, you're missing the point. Please keep that in mind. We establish the formal definitions of our terms as follows. Redemption, the recovery from sin and death by the obedience and sacrifice of Christ. Atonement and reconciliation, the removal of the separation between God and man, such that those who are reconciled are at peace. Objective justification, God's verdict that the world is no longer guilty of sin for the sake of Christ's life, death, and resurrection. Subjective justification, the individual application of objective justification received through faith as the instrumental cause. The doctrine of objective justification formally teaches that Christ's life, death, and resurrection redeemed all men and atoned for the sins of all mankind, reconciling all men to the Father and declaring all men not guilty for the sake of Christ. The doctrine of subjective justification, the corollary to the doctrine of objective justification, teaches that each individual man must receive objective justification through the instrumental cause of faith so he may reach beatitude. Therefore, the entire world is justified by the merits of Christ, but that justification is delivered to individuals through faith as an instrumental cause. Let us now proceed to our disputation whether the distinction between objective justification and subjective justification is a faithful interpretation of the Holy Scriptures as well as the fathers of Lutheran orthodoxy. Objection 1. The reduction to the absurdity of universal salvation. Major premise. If Christ's merits justify all men, then all men will receive eternal life. Minor premise. But not all men will receive eternal life. Conclusion. Christ's merits do not justify all men. In defense of the major premise, we bring forth the teaching of the scriptures that those who are justified inherit eternal life. Romans 5.1 says, quote, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. End quote. Romans 5.9 says, quote, Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. End quote. Romans 8.30 says, quote, And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. End quote. Titus 3.7 says, quote, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. End quote. In defense of the minor premise, we bring forth the teaching of the scriptures that not all will be saved. Matthew 13, 49 through 50 says, quote, So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing of gnashing and teeth. End quote. Matthew 25, 41 through 46. Quote, then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. End quote. Mark 9, 43. Quote, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell into that fire that shall never be quenched. End quote. 2 Thessalonians 1, 8 through 9. Quote, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. End quote. Jude 7 through 8. Quote, As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. End quote. Revelation 20, 15, quote, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire, end quote. And finally, Revelation 21, 8, quote, that the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death, 
end quote. Therefore, we can conclude that it appears that the distinction between objective and subjective justification is repugnant to the teaching of the scriptures and must be declared false. Objection two, that faith becomes superfluous. Major premise, if objective justification is true, then faith is not necessary for salvation. Minor premise, faith is necessary for salvation. Conclusion, therefore, the doctrine of objective justification is false. In defense of the major premise that objective justification eliminates the need for faith, we state that such is formally contained in objective justification as a doctrine. That is, objective justification teaches that justification occurs regardless of the faith of any man. Objective justification is called universal objective justification precisely because the proponents of the view say that all are justified, even those who do not believe. Therefore, if individuals are justified regardless of their faith, we may say that faith does nothing to justify. In defense of the minor premise, we declare that faith is necessary for salvation by a necessity of supposition. Should someone have faith, they are saved. Should someone not have faith, they are not saved. Such is the explicit teaching of the scriptures. Quote, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. End quote. Mark 16, 16. Quote, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world, and men love to darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. End quote. John 12, 48, He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in that day. End quote. Hebrews 3, 12, quote, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. End quote. Hebrews 11, 6, quote, but without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is rewarder of those who diligently seek him, End quote. Therefore, we may conclude that faith is necessary for salvation, and as a consequence, that the doctrine of universal objective justification is false. Objection 3, that the gospel is only a past reality. Major premise. If all men are justified by Christ at his death and resurrection, then the gospel is merely informative about past forgiveness, and there is no impartation of forgiveness now. Minor premise, but the gospel is not merely information about past forgiveness, and there truly is impartation of forgiveness now. Therefore, we may conclude that the doctrine of objective justification, at the very least, is questionable pastorally. In defense of the major premise, we state that objective justification formally teaches that Christ's death and resurrection accomplish justification for the world. This is a temporal statement that the justification of the world happens over the span of at least a few days, those days in which our Lord was crucified, died, was buried, and rose again. Therefore, if the world is justified and forgiven of sins in the past, then there is no additional forgiveness that anyone needs now. The gospel is not powerful and active, but a series of historical propositions. The gospel is truly a statement about the future, that God will save you if you believe. Therefore, objective justification, if it is true, makes justification unfortunately about past events instead of future events, which seems absurd. In defense of the minor premise, we note that the promises for forgiveness are given in light of faith, which means that forgiveness is achieved in the future. When you have faith, you are forgiven. Therefore, the gospel cannot be a series of propositions about the past, but instead trust in God regarding conditional promises for the future. And these conditional promises are met by God in that he gives the gift of faith. It is evident about the scriptures that forgiveness is not something that occurred once, but something received by those once they believe in the present and the future. Matthew 6, 14 through 15, quote, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. End quote. Mark eleven twenty five quote, and whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. End quote. Luke 6, 37, quote, Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. End quote. Quote, then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. End quote. That's Luke 23, 34. Acts 7, 59 through 60, quote, and they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep, end quote. Therefore, we may conclude that universal objective justification is at the very least confusing and does not help pastorally. 
Objection 4. The Novelty of Such Doctrine The Lutheran Fathers did not teach universal objective justification. Therefore, universal objective justification is novel to the faith, and thus likely false, if not outright false. This is a fairly obvious objection that we should not introduce novel doctrines into our interpretation of Scripture. We do not find this kind of language in the ancient fathers, nor do we find this language in the Lutheran theologians of old. The burden of proof rests on the supporters of universal objective justification to defend this doctrine because it adds to the Lutheran faith. Objection 5. The Disposability of Universal Objective Justification The objective-subjective distinction in justification has no proper function at best and is harmful at worst. This is a more pragmatic argument that the doctrine of universal objective justification may be a kind of legomachy, a mere dispute over words that is not necessary. At best, we are simply quibbling over words such that there is no dispute, and the doctrine entails no change in daily piety or overall systematic beliefs. And at worst, the doctrine confuses the Christian and changes their daily piety. So we should not burden the Christian with these notions. On the contrary, we teach that Christ has justified the entire world, both believers and unbelievers. However, faith serves as the instrumental cause to deliver that justification to the individual. Faith is therefore suppositionally necessary for salvation insofar as it serves as the hand that grasps that which Christ has accomplished for us. As the instrumental cause of justification, faith saves insofar as it grasps the merits of Christ and the justification that has been won for us. Therefore, we affirm universal objective justification against the adversaries and advance several arguments against the deniers of the intensive perfection of Christ's work. Argument 1. That justification and reconciliation are inseparable. Major premise. If Christ has reconciled the whole world to God, then Christ has justified all men. Minor premise. Christ has reconciled the whole world to God. Conclusion. Therefore, Christ has justified all men. Both premises are highly disputed in this controversy, and therefore must be defended with precision and rigor. The major premise has several notes that we must examine for a thorough elucidation of the argument. First, notice that we identify the whole world as all men. That is, we believe that the term whole world extends to all men who ever have existed and ever will exist. Of course, we are defining a man as a human being, male or female. Therefore, we do not only say that Christ reconciles all kinds of men, but that he reconciles all men to God. This would be especially controversial if we were debating with the Reformed, but I must insist that this argument is primarily against those who call themselves Lutheran and yet deny this holy doctrine. A separate video would be necessary for a critique of the doctrine of limited atonement, which we find in the Reformed. Suffice it to say that those whom I attack in this video would not like to be called Calvinists. And so, with that in mind, I suggest that you either affirm that the term for world, cosmos, identifies all men, or you align yourselves with the Reformed and deny the unlimited atonement, a key Lutheran doctrine. The term cosmos is used for world in 2 Corinthians 5.19. And it is also used in John 1.29, John 3.16, John 17.9, and 1 John 2.2. These are the key passages used by Lutherans historically to argue that Christ died for all men. Therefore, if one denies that the term world in 2 Corinthians 5.19 encompasses all men, then one must consistently deny the extensive perfection of the atonement which places one outside the bounds of Lutheran orthodoxy. Second, regarding the major premise, is the more controversial note that reconciliation entails justification. We teach that the non-imputation of sins is the immediate effect of reconciliation with God. We distinguish between redemption, reconciliation, and justification, but we do not separate them. Reconciliation yields salvation, as Paul says, quote, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life, end quote, Romans 5.10. Paul specifically identifies that we are saved because of that reconciliation. Reconciliation accomplishes salvation. Justification also accomplishes salvation. Therefore, at the very least, they are tightly linked, such that one cannot occur without the other. And so, if one is reconciled to God, then one is justified. We are reconciled to God through Christ's death, and Christ died for all. Therefore, all are reconciled to God in Christ. In fact, the link between reconciliation and justification need not be established in such heavy logic. We may simply cite 2 Corinthians 5.19, which says that God reconciled the world to himself through Christ, quote, not imputing their trespasses to them, end quote. The basis for their reconciliation and non-imputation are therefore inseparable, and the non-imputation of sins is to be justified. Therefore, when one is reconciled, one is justified. Such is obviously Lutheran doctrine when we examine the clear words of Scripture and our great theologians. 
Psalm 32, 2, quote, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. End quote. Martin Chemnitz writes, quote, The law shows sin, accuses, imputes guilt, and condemns sin, but the gospel remits, covers, and does not impute sin, because it points to the Lamb of God. End quote. That's from his Loki Theologicy. Chemnitz again in the Loki Theologicy writes, quote, In Romans 5.10, the word to be reconciled is clearly a synonym for to be justified. End quote. This is the most obvious citation I have. Chemnitz himself says that justification and reconciliation are identical in terms. Though we may not go as far as him, and there is some leeway with that, we nonetheless recognize that his position is a clear exposition of some form of universal objective justification, and so we identify Chemnitz as a member of our party. So following his logic, if the world is reconciled, then the whole world is justified. But let us continue with more of Chemnitz's writings. Quote, the free imputation in the article of justification is the grace of God, which for the sake of Christ does not impute against us the sins inhering in us, 2 Corinthians 5.19, and imputes to us the perfect righteousness which does not inhere in us and which is worthy of eternal life, end quote. Once again, Loki Theologicy, Volume 2. Chemnitz again writes, quote, This imputation is also a relationship of the divine mind and will, which out of free mercy and for the sake of Christ does not impute their sins to the believers, but imputes to them righteousness, that is, they are considered before God at the tribunal of his judgment as if they had perfect righteousness dwelling in them, and therefore salvation and eternal life are given to them as righteous people. End quote. Once again, Loki Theologicy. Johann Gerhard writes, quote, For to be justified is to not be called into judgment, to not be condemned, to not come into judgment, to not be judged. The tax collector went down to his own home justified, namely, absolved of his sins. He had prayed for forgiveness with serious groans. The Apostle Paul explains that to justify is to impute righteousness, to reckon faith for righteousness, to cover up iniquities, to not count sin, to remit sins, to forgive sins. The following phrases also pertain here to be reconciled to God, to be counted righteous, to become a partaker of blessing, to receive the forgiveness of sins, to be saved. An elegant example of justification is especially shown to us in the servant who owed his master 10,000 talents and obtained the remission of the debt and relaxation of the punishment because of his master's grace. End quote. That is from his On Justification Through Faith, the etymology and meaning of the word justification. Gerhard approvingly cites Bernard of Clairvaux, saying, quote, where there is reconciliation, there is also forgiveness of sins. And what is that justification? End quote. Also from his On Justification Through Faith, the forensic meaning is demonstrated. Gerhard also writes, quote, The apostle claims that he is justified and reconciled to God through the blood of Christ, and yet the reconciliation signifies the remission of sins, acceptance into grace, etc. End quote. Once again, On Justification Through Faith. I do not know how the doctrine of objective justification could be more obvious in Gerhard than when he responds to the objection that if Christ made satisfaction, then all people would be saved. Quote, they make a further counter-argument. If Christ made satisfaction, then all people, even the openly ungodly, would be saved. We respond, there must be a distinction between the winning of the benefit and its application. The former is general, since Christ earned the forgiveness of sins for all people with his death, but the latter is specific. Since only believers become sharers of this benefit through faith. After the apostle had stated that God was in Christ, reconciled the world to himself, he adds that God gave the ministry of reconciliation to him and to the rest of the apostles so that people might be reconciled to God and become partakers of Christ's benefit. And quote, once again, on justification through faith. Quenched at, when responding to the argument that universal atonement entails a universal salvation, writes, quote, this clearly is shown from 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 19. That is, reconciliation has been made with respect to the acquiring of the benefit by Christ's death. And yet, God hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. We pray you be reconciled. Reconciliation is still to be made with respect to its application, end quote, such as cited by Schmid in his Doctrinal Theology of the Evangelical Lutheran Church. At this point, the minor premise should be obvious, that Christ reconciled the whole world to God according to 2 Corinthians 5, 19, which says, quote, that is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. End quote. Argument two, that Christ's redemption must mirror Adam's fall. This argument is rather simple. In Romans 5, it is said that Christ is the second Adam, reversing that which our progenitor did. 
quote, therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the offense. For if by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, for the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation, but the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. For if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. End quote. Romans 5, 12 through 17. Therefore, it's pretty obvious what conclusion we must find. If Adam makes all men sinners, and Christ came to undo what Adam did, then Christ would make all men righteous. Taylor writes, quote, If the offense of one had such far-reaching effect as to bring the judgment of death upon all men, much more will the righteousness of Christ result in the justification of life unto all men. It is absolutely arbitrary and without foundation in text and context if we restrict all men and many to the believers, end quote. Argument 3 that Christ completed our justification at the resurrection. This argument is rather key both pastorally and theologically. Major premise, if the doctrine of objective justification is not true, then justification is not a past event. Minor premise, but justification is a past event. Conclusion, therefore the doctrine of objective justification is true. The major premise is rather obvious, and is actually lobbed at the supporters of the doctrine as an objection. Objective justification says that Christ won the justification of the world, so it occurred at his death and resurrection, and that the individual believer's faith serves as the instrumental cause, delivering that justification to them. So the major premise should be granted. The real controversy rests in the minor premise. The minor premise states that Christ's work includes the procurement of justification for all men. 2 Corinthians 5.19 is in the past tense, saying that God was reconciling us to Christ. We appropriate the argument for the inseparability of reconciliation and justification from before, and note that if reconciliation was a past event, so too was justification. The gospel tells us that God has reconciled the world to himself, and that by faith we receive this gift. Not that we need faith to activate forgiveness, as though forgiveness requires a composite efficient cause. We offer man a finished product, not a future possibility. So when the Apology of the Augsburg Confession says, quote, when a man believes that his sins are forgiven because of Christ and that God is reconciled and favorably disposed to him because of Christ, this personal faith obtains the forgiveness of sins and justifies us, end quote. That is from Article 4. We agree wholeheartedly. A denial of objective justification says that a man cannot believe that his sins are forgiven, or at the very least, the denial says that you believe that because you believe your sins are forgiven. So on what do you grasp your faith? The merits of Christ do not cover you. They are abstract, and you must bring them to you. Faith becomes another efficient cause, which runs contrary to the statement of the apology that the gospel, quote, offers forgiveness and justification, which are received by faith, end quote. Article 4. 62. Bellarmine, the Roman Catholic apologist, objects that if we are justified by faith, then we must believe that we are forgiven already. He understands our doctrine better than those who deny it. Kalov comments in response, saying that, quote, justification is the object of faith in that it is offered by God in the gospel. It is the effect of faith insofar as grace, having been apprehended by faith, the forgiveness of sins happens to us by that very act, end quote. John Benedict Karpsov writes, quote, The forgiveness of sins is considered in a twofold manner. First, as it has been acquired by Christ and is offered as a benefit promised and intended by God for sinners to be sought and had in the word and sacraments. Afterwards, forgiveness is considered as it has already been accepted by faith, has been applied, and is possessed. In the first manner, the forgiveness of sins is the object of faith insofar as it justifies, end quote. Think of the large catechism commenting on the creed, quote, the work is done and accomplished, for Christ has acquired and gained the treasure for us by his suffering, death, and resurrection. But if the work remained concealed so that no one knew of it, then it would be in vain and lost. That this treasure, therefore, might not lie buried, but be appropriated and enjoyed, God has caused the word to go forth and be proclaimed, 
in which he gives the Holy Ghost to bring this treasure home and appropriate it to us, end quote. That's from Article 338. Again, the apology, the Augsburg Confession, quote, he forgave to all sins which no one could avoid, and by the shedding of his own blood, blotted out the handwriting which was against us, end quote. Again, from Article 4, 103. And so we invert the argument against the opponent of objective justification. On what is your faith based? That Christ died for you? But what does this accomplish if he has not forgiven your sins? Does faith cause your salvation as though you contribute and activate adornment forgiveness? Or do you receive that which God has won? What did Christ win for you in his death and resurrection? And now we respond to the objections. Response to objection one, that all would be saved. We respond that this argument obviously confuses objective and subjective justification, and we again cite Johann Gerhard, who describes this belief better than I. Quote, they make a further counter-argument. If Christ made satisfaction, then all people, even the openly ungodly, would be saved. We respond, there must be a distinction between the winning of a benefit and its application. The former is general, since Christ earned the forgiveness of sins for all people with his death. But the latter is specific, since only believers become sharers in the benefit through faith. And after the apostle had stated that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, he adds that God gave the ministry of reconciliation to him and to the rest of the apostles so that people might be reconciled to God and become partakers of Christ's benefits. End quote from on justification through faith. This also sufficiently responds to the second objection that faith is no longer necessary for salvation. And we repeat our counter-argument that they pervert the role of faith into a proper efficient cause rather than the instrumental cause of justification. We responded to objection three with our third argument that Christ has won our justification in his death and resurrection, where we say that is actually a good point for the support of objective justification. Response to Objection 4, the novelty of the doctrine. That the Lutheran fathers did not know of the doctrine of objective justification has been demonstrated as false above, but we nonetheless bring forth more testimonies from our fathers. I must confess that I draw these citations from a footnote in one of Jordan Cooper's old blog posts on this, so I did not find these myself, but I use them nonetheless, and I thank whomever it was that compiled this. From St. John Chrysostom's discourses against Judaizing Christians. Quote, all human nature was taken in the foulest evils. All have sinned, says Paul, Romans 3.23. They were locked, as it were, in a prison by the curse of their transgression of the law. The sentence of the judge was going to be passed against them. A letter from the king came down from heaven. Rather, the king himself came. Without examination, without exacting an account, he set all men free from the chains of their sins. All then who run to Christ are saved by grace and profit from his gift, but those who wish to find justification from the law will also fall from grace. They will not be able to enjoy the king's loving kindness because they are striving to gain salvation by their own efforts. They will draw down on themselves the curse of the law because by the works of the law no flesh will find justification. End quote. Ambrose writing to Irenaeus, this is his 73rd epistle, quote, the law of Moses entered into the place of the natural law, since deception had banished that natural law and nearly blotted it out of the human breast, pride reignited and disobedience was rampant. Therefore, that other law of Moses took its place so that by its written expression, it might challenge us and shut our mouth in order to make the whole world subject to God. The world, however, became subject to him through the law because all are brought to trial by the prescript of the law, and no one is justified by the works of the law. In other words, because the knowledge of sin comes from the law, but guilt is not remitted, the law, therefore, which has made all men sinners, seems to have caused harm. But when the Lord Jesus Christ came, he forgave all men the sin, so they could not escape, and canceled the decree against us by shedding his blood. End quote. From the Augsburg Confession, Article 6. Quote, Likewise, the churches among us teach that this faith is bound to yield good fruits and that it ought to do good works commanded by God on account of God's will, and not so that we may trust in these works to merit justification before God. For forgiveness of sins and justification are taken hold of by faith, as the saying of Christ also testifies, when you have done all things, say we are worthless slaves. 
The authors of the ancient church teach the same. For Ambrose says, It is established by God that whoever believes in Christ shall be saved without work, by faith alone receiving the forgiveness of sins as a gift. End quote. Quote, To say that the Son of David is sitting at the right hand of God means that the Son of God is risen from the dead. His resurrection from the dead is our justification through faith alone. To say that we are justified by faith alone means that all the righteousness of the law and of human beings are condemned. And quote, that's Martin Luther, Disputations on Justifying Faith and Miracle Working Faith, and that we are justified by faith alone. Quote, Christ's keys help in the attainment of heaven and eternal life, for he himself calls them keys to the kingdom of heaven, because they close heaven to the hardened sinner and open it to the repentant one. Consequently, there must lie hidden in the keys of Christ his blood, death, and resurrection, by which he has opened to us heaven and thus imparts through the keys to poor sinners what he has wrought through his blood. The office of the keys is a high and divine office, aiding our souls to pass from sin and death to grace and life. It grants them righteousness without any merit of works, solely through forgiveness of sins. End quote. Martin Luther, The Keys. From John Quistorf the Elder, commenting on 2 Corinthians 5.19, as quoted in Friedrich A. Schmidt, Justification, Subjective and Objective. Quote, the word justification and reconciliation is used in a twofold manner, one, in respect to the acquired merit, two, in respect of the appropriated merit. Thus, all are justified, and some are justified, all in respect of the acquired merit, some in respect of the appropriated merit. End quote. Finally, from Johann Gerhard's On Creation and Predestination, quote, The scholastics correctly teach that Christ, to the extent that it is in him, freed all. But the reason that not all become partakers of his grace lies in their own culpability, namely because they do not cling in faith to the mediator. End quote. And so we conclude that Christ has justified all men, hey everyone. and that faith Thanks serves for as watching another scholastic law, applying video. justification to the individual. If you'd like to support us, you can follow us on Twitter at Gerhard's Ghost, or contribute on Patreon at Scholastic Lutherans. There you'll get access to our Telegram chat and other perks. Links can be found in the description. Subscribe, like, or leave a comment, and have a nice day.